Thank you for that stirring rendition this morning. Good morning. I'm Malin Fassell, and I'm blessed to be here as your liturgist this morning. We will review several announcements. First of all, I want to welcome visitors. We are pleased you've chosen to worship with us here at Holidays First United, Holidaysburg First United Methodist Church, and um, would urge others to uh, search out folks who are visiting with us. First of all, our annual charge conference will be held on Monday, November 27th at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. All are welcome to attend. This is the annual opportunity for you to receive a full set of reports about the church's official activities, reports that need to be filed with the conference, including budget, attendance, etc. It is also an opportunity for you to vote on individuals who have been nominated by your nominating committee to serve on the leadership team, trustees, endowment, um, and in other areas of the official church life. There is some peanut brittle from the sale available in the kitchen following the service while supplies last. $15 per pound and it's very delicious. If anyone would like to join this outstanding group in which I participate to sing during the Christmas season, please be in touch with Susan Hamilton, uh, call the church office. We would welcome anybody who's interested, has sung before, or wants to uh, try that out for the first time. You're all welcome. Mark your calendars. Christmas Eve services this year are at 4 p.m., a family service. <clears throat> 6 p.m. a contemporary service, 8 p.m. a traditional services. Also a reminder, there will be no Sunday morning, morning, Sunday morning worship services on Christmas Eve. Check the blue insert in your bulletin for more details. Thank you. Good morning, church. And uh, a very happy veterans worship service this morning to each of you today. We recognize, if you look into your bulletins, you would see that we're going to pay tribute to those who served from our congregation in the nation's military. 
Your service enables us to enjoy many freedoms, especially this freedom of assembly, freedom to worship. And so all veterans, first responders, and those who served the nation in times of crisis, would I please, can I please request you to stand as we honor you with Have you got uh, your pen? <laughs> In an attitude of worship, let's continue to worship God in uh, our call to worship. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No, no one's serving as a soldier. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. If the mind will be the mind, both will fall into a pit. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Amen. Let's enter into a time of prayer. Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes? And let's pray for our own needs. Let's pray for the nation. 
and the veterans, especially those who are deprived of basic necessities. For the global situation, especially in that flashpoint, the city of peace, Jerusalem, and the whole of the Middle East. If there's any in your family that needs prayer, please place them at the altar. In your circle of friends, if anyone has requested you to pray for them, please take a few minutes to pray for them. Let's please remember those who are going through bereavement, through loss, through pain, Let's rejoice with those who rejoice, who are spe celebrating special days in their lives, birthdays, anniversaries, and other special days. O oh Lord, we bow down in your holy presence. We want to worship you in the splendor and the beauty of your holiness. Fill the sanctuary with your holiness, with your power, with your grace and love. As we on this Veteran Sunday think of this nation and we really say, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea that we would never compromise the gospel. This nation, <coughs> that it would forever be known as a city on a hill. That we would never turn our backs on the cross. That you would be exalted in every branch of the government in every institution. We thank you for it's not just cliche. No matter who's president, you are king. So we thank you once again as we remember special needs in our congregation. And we place our needs, the needs of our nation and our own lives on the altar. And we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Standing on a hillside with his followers, Jesus gave them this great command just before he returned to his father. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Teach people to know and follow me and do what I've said. I will always be with you. The mission was clear, and those who devoted their lives to it changed the world forever.
Thank you for remaining standing. Now we will do the prayer for the cause of liberty in unison. Almighty God, you are our creator and sustainer. On this Veterans Day worship service, we thank you for those who have served in America's armed forces. Lord, you have inspired many of our best and brightest to volunteer to proudly stand and defend our beloved country. We gather today to remember those who have steadfastly served in their chosen branch of our military, which enables us to walk as free men and women in this land. We are grateful that you inspired their sense of patriotism and strengthened them in unselfish service. Their courage and vigilance have ensured freedom and peace we enjoy today. The cause of liberty is yours. Prepare us for that time when the last trumpet will sound, when the last flag will be folded, when the last salute has been given, when all the flowers have given way today. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. You may now be seated for the scripture readings. First comes from Psalm 91. <clears throat> he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For it is he who rescues you from the net of the trapper and from the deadly plague. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings. You may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a wall. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day or of the plague that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that devastates at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the retaliation against the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, the most high, your dwelling place. No evil will happen to you, nor will any plague come upon or near your tent. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. On their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will walk upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. Because he has loved me, I will save him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. I will satisfy him with a long life and show my salvation. Second reading from 2 Timothy verse 2, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who shall be qualified and teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, our topic for this morning, Veteran Sunday service, is Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ Arise. And our text for this morning is the second reading that we re heard read from 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'd be concentrating on two verses from there. It'll come on your screens, the second reading, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and your hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Even before we go any further, I want to thank Pastor Myron, for sharing God's holy word with us last Sunday, and Brother Doug, uh, may God continue to use you in his holy ministry. You just raised the bar, and that's quite a challenge now. So thank you for your ministry. And your hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, which we had time to discuss why Paul uses Jesus Christ in some places and in other places, Christ Jesus, but we'd keep that for another day. And your hardship and your suffering, if you're going through pain, if you're going through suffering, endure it as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, a little context for this text. When is Paul writing this letter? These are Paul's very last words, his very last words, before he was beheaded in AD 68 by Emperor Nero, Nero Germanicus Caesar. Paul died as a veteran soldier for Jesus and your suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul endured much suffering. Anyone who's called to God's holy ministry, the pastors here would tell you, will have to go through much hardship and endure much suffering. Reminds me of a story I heard long, long years ago. It's a story of an Air Force mayor, major, I'm sorry, an Air Force major who was just promoted to the rank of a colonel. And that morning he came to his new office and he saw all the trophies in his new office. And as he was admiring all the trophies, he heard a knock on his door. And he answered the door and in walked in an airman. And uh, this colonel really wanted to impress the airman. You know, he's just new to the position, so he really wanted to impress the airman. He picked up the telephone and he spoke with a loud voice so the airman could hear every word he's saying. He said, Mr. President, how wonderful to hear that you're wishing me on my very first day at work. Thank you. I'll pass on all the information you give me to the general who will be coming to my office a little later. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for this call. Your telephone call means a great deal to me. Have a good day, sir. Goodbye. And he put down the phone, and then he told the airman, guess who just called? The president himself. And why are you here? And the airman said, uh, 
Nothing important, sir. I just came here to repair your telephone. It's not working. <laughs> Our text for today reminds us that we are all soldiers of Jesus, all of us. On earth, in ecclesiastical circles, we have many distinctions, many categories, many levels, clergy, laity, and all that stuff. But in heaven, we are all equal. No clergy, no laity. We are all equal, priesthood of all believers. It was John R. W. Stott, wasn't it, who said these infamous, beautiful words. He said, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. The ground at the foot of the cross is level when you hear that last accolade, the greatest accolade you'd ever hear from the lips of Jesus himself when he says, well done, my good and faithful clergy, my good and faithful laity, or my good and faithful servant. We are all equal. What are the marks of a good soldier of Jesus? A good soldier of Jesus primarily is faithful, completely faithful, completely obedient to his commanding officer. Notice verse 4. He always wants to please his commanding officer, that last phrase. A good soldier is faithful, is completely obedient to the soldier's instruction manual, correct? What is the Christian's instruction manual? The Bible. Years ago when I was in Sunday school, I remember my Sunday school teacher teaching me the acronym for Bible. B-I-B-L-E. Anyone of you knows what it is? B-I-B-L-E. Uh, any guesses? Basic instructions before leaving Earth. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. If you really want to enjoy eternity with Jesus, we should know basic instructions. So the Bible, the Bible, the world may mock us that we believe in a document that's so ancient, our old-fashioned, do you really believe in this sanctuary? You believe in the virgin birth? You really do? Do you believe in the resurrection? Do you really believe in the second coming, that he's going to come down on a cloud? What cloud would it be? A cumulonimbus cloud? What cloud would it be? Do you really believe in creation? All this was created in six days, and in the, on the seventh day he rested. Do you really believe in all this? Postmodern, the movement, post-Christian America, post-truth society mocks us, condemns us, ridicules us. But then we must be in complete agreement with the foundational message of the Bible. There are three points in history, whether sacred or secular history, there are three points. The commencement, the culmination, and the center. The commencement, the culmination, and the center. Commencement, creation, culmination, second coming the center of crucifixion. Creation, the second coming, crucifixion. We must know our instruction manual 
or we cannot be good soldiers of Jesus. How well do we know our instruction manual? How well do we know what we believe? Or have we just been born as cradle Christians and grown up with this, not really thinking through what we believe? If I have to ask you, why do you believe in the virgin birth? Would you be able to answer me? Do you really believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Give me, how can you believe in resurrection? Do you really believe he'll come down in the clouds, on the clouds one day, and he'll receive you midair? We must know just not what we believe, but why we believe what we believe. Very, very, very important. There was this director of finance in the government. He was also, in his local church, a lay preacher. He would go to different places and preach. But he held this very important office in the government, and people would come and meet him from different departments. He took early retirement to everyone's surprise. He left that beautiful job and then he went into ministry because he said that the Lord had called him to ministry. The bishop told him, since you occupied such a high position, you name which congregation you want to be in and I'll post you there. But the man said, I prefer to be in rural village churches and he served the Lord in village churches throughout his ministry. He was quite old. And then uh, one morning while he was preaching on a topic, resurrection of Jesus, militants walked into this church. This actually happened. Hindu militants, RSS, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang, a right-wing Hindu nationalist militant paramilitary organization. He was preaching in a place called Kanakapura and Ramnagaram in Karnataka. And they were attacking the congregation and the pastor. The pastor said, can we please have an open discussion? Why are you doing this? They said, you're preaching resurrection. We believe in karma. That's Hinduism, karma. That what is karma? The cycle of birth and rebirth. Karma, samsara, karma. If you're born in this life as one thing, you'll be reborn in the next life in a higher form. If you're born as a cockroach in this life, and if you're a good cockroach, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you'll be promoted to the next life to be a rodent, to be a rat. That's karma, the doctrine of karma. That is their logic. So this senior pastor, he said, can we have an open discussion? You prove the doctrine of karma, and if you prove it, I'll believe it. And let me, if you permit me, I'll tell you why I believe in the resurrection. And then that discussion went on, and to everyone's surprise, the leader of the Hindu militant organization started believing in the resurrection because he didn't know why he believed in karma. And another, his right-hand man, became also a believer in the resurrection. That man, that elderly pastor, happens to be my father. He's now no more. He's going to be with the Lord. I remember he never aligned the congregation. He never aligned God's word to suit his congregation. Never aligned God's word to suit his congregation. He made his congregation align themselves to God's word. <coughs> Excuse me. 
very important that we align ourselves to God's word. And here we see we are soldiers of Jesus. Imagine soldiers fighting against each other when the enemy army is approaching them. Look around you at the church today, the state of the church. Every denomination fighting against each other. When we have a bigger enemy to deal with, we should be united, united. How much of the Bible, this instruction manual that we say is the word of God, how much of it is really the word of God? How much of it is inspired? How much of it is God breathed? That's inspiration, correct? God breathed. Second Timothy, we are in Second Timothy. We are in chapter two. These words, these words. Move to chapter 3 and you'll get the answer. How much of the Bible is, is inspired by God? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired. All scripture. Yes, the virgin birth is inspired. Yes, the second coming is inspired. Every doc doctrine in the Bible is inspired. Every comma in the Bible is inspired by God. And then it continues, it's profitable for four things, for teaching, the Bible, study, sit to learn, stand, and lead. So here, for teaching, and the second, for rebuking. Oh, that's frightening. When the Bible rebukes us, we don't like it because it ruffles too many feathers. But the Bible says... God's word is for rebuking. If you're in the kitchen and your little grandchild touches the hot pan, you'd first instruct the child, you'll teach the child, don't touch that, your hand would burn. But if the child still insists and touches it, you'll rebuke the child, not because you hate the child, but because of just the opposite. And then, correct, for teaching, for rebuking, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped to do every good work. That's what 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says. For teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Yes, we don't like correction, but the word of God is for that to align ourselves to God's word. Wasn't it Jesus' words in Mark chapter 3 and verse 25? He says these amazing words, a house divided against itself will fall. Mark 3.25, please mark that, important. Amos agrees. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? How can we walk together except we be agreed on God's word? We are following the same instruction manual. So here, we must be a good soldier, must be faithful. A good soldier must be a follower of the commanding officer and his instruction manual. Our highest goal must be to please Jesus. The world is ever near drawing us, but don't get attracted by the attractions of the world. I wonder who said it, but I remember what he said, all attractions outside of Christ is a distraction. All attractions outside of Christ. Can you imagine? All attractions outside of Christ is at best only a distraction. So the Christian's motto is simple. A Christian soldier's motto is very simple. None to impress, one to please. 
Can we say that together? None to impress, one to please. Don't be like that colonel who tried to impress the airman. None to impress, one to please. I close with Alexander the Great. He is with his, with his famous philosopher Dionigi, Di, Diogenes. Diogenes, his philosophy is amazing and he is having this discussion with Alexander the Great as this world conqueror is surveying a huge heap of bones. He had just conquered this army, commander and all, and now he revisits this place to see how many people he killed in battle. He's proud, he's strutting, he's walking up and down, seeing how he conquered this army. Diogenes, on the other hand, is pensive and thoughtful, and he is wondering. Alexander said, this is time for celebration. Why are you so quiet? And he said, I'm thinking of something. You see, all these bones are alike. There is no distinction between the bones of the commander and the bones of a slave. <laughs> we are all equal. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. And we all will please our commanding officer. His name is Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. It was Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, who said, it's always too early to quit. It's always too early to quit. So on this Veteran Sunday, let's remember that we as soldiers of Christ must arise at such a time as this. And we close our Veterans Sunday worship service with the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Let's stand as we sing this. Thank you.
let's receive God's benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the constant abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, that we as your soldiers, with your truth that we will keep marching on, in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a blessed week. Thank you very much.
The temple veil was torn wide open That before our God we may stand I will sing a love triumphant Hell's strong gates were overcome For the grave it could not hold him Jesus Christ Man